Welcome to Autism Knows No Borders. Discover what's possible when people impacted by autism inspire change and build community. Together with the Global Autism Project, here's your host, Rachel Harmon. Hello, everyone. Our guest today is Pamela Fisher. Pam is a registered music therapist from Sydney, Australia. She is skilled in voice, guitar, piano, improvisation, and clinical supervision. With over 15 years of experience specializing in groups and individuals with autism, Pam provides music therapy services both in person and online. In today's conversation, Pam gives us a brief history of autism awareness in Australia and explains which services are covered by government funding. She defines what music therapy is and shares how she got involved in the field. We talk about different populations who can benefit from services and discuss some common misconceptions. Through simulating various musical interventions, Pam demonstrates different goals she may work on in a session. We also point out the benefits of collaborating with behavior analysts and speech therapists when writing programs. Pam has created a musical kit to target different sensory needs a child may have. In this episode, discover what's possible when music unlocks hidden strengths. For more information about Pam and her work, please visit our show notes at autismknowsnoborders.com. And now, I present you... Pamela Fisher. What a sweet welcoming to our episode. (laughs) Hi, Pam. Welcome (laughs) to Autism Knows No Borders. Thank you for being here. Thank you so much, Rachel, for having me. Let me just say your voice is so beautiful. (laughs) I just got the chills listening to you. It's so soothing. Oh, aren't you lovely? (laughs) (laughs) I'm excited to share the world of music therapy with our listeners. First, let's start with how autism is understood in Australia. Okay, well, I guess autism in Australia has been fairly in line with that of the more developed countries such as the USA and UK. Before 1984, funding was very much limited into the services that were outside of school funding programs and therefore parents with children with autism or any kind of disability for that matter were left responsible to fund services such as speech therapy, occupational therapy and of course music therapy was still very, very new in Australia at that stage and still finding its feet. Yeah, so there's just been a growing awareness of autism in general. Yeah, absolutely. After this time, after 1984, when our Labor government, Prime Minister Bob Hawke, he introduced Medicare, where the federal government funds health professionals, including doctors, allied health professionals and psychologists through Medicare funding. So basically, this funded private healthcare settings, which are run as businesses. So in 2008, the federal government launched a funding program that was called Helping Children with Autism or otherwise known as HACWA. That funding basically provided a capped funding for diagnosis and assessment of children under the age of seven and using Medicare billing. The HACWA funding also included intervention funding. So that kind of funding HACWA has now finished because we have recently, well, when I say recently, it was in 2016 that a federal funding body happened, which was the National Disability Insurance Scheme, otherwise known as the NDIS. So basically the NDIS scheme's purpose was to deliver care and support for the life 
of people with severe and profound disabilities using an individualised and lifetime approach, including accommodation and day programs, allied health professionals such as myself, and access to support workers and transport, respite, and, as well as assistive technologies to help with communication. Wow. For life. Yeah, for life. Basically every year it's reassessed and allied health professionals are then basically made to write a report based on the intervention and services that you that they have received during that year and make recommendations on that report. And then the NDIS basically reassesses the amount given for that year and keeps on going like that, yeah. Mm -hmm. Is it usually enough? Um, For some people, more than enough. Some people, not enough at all, yeah. I'm constantly struggling in my report writing to really make my point known that they definitely need music therapy because of the fact that it connects with them or or for whatever reason. Mm -hmm. Are families supported emotionally? I feel like there is a big gap in terms of that. It just seems very clinical. It seems that, okay, well, if you have a son or daughter with autism and you're having some issues yourself with, you know, coming to terms with the diagnosis, it's almost like, okay, well, here is a psychologist going, or here's some pills going, (laughs) Mm. you know, take care of yourself, which is really unfortunate. At the same time, you know, we're very grateful to have those services available to us. Yeah. Is there any kind of stigma related to mental health or disabilities in general? I think it's getting better, absolutely getting better. For people with autism specifically, I think I've seen such a, an improvement over my journey as a music therapist and the fact that The NDIS is here, the National Disability Insurance Scheme is here. It's really brought so much more awareness to people with a disability and accessibility being a number one factor in everything that we do here. So even to the point where there's operas now made specifically for children on the spectrum or children who have a disability. So, yeah, it's... I believe it's getting better. Mm -hmm. So those operas are maybe not too loud or they accommodate some sensory issues? That's right. That's right. And there's also these beautiful music days that have the Sydney Symphony Orchestra come to a specific event where children with autism go to and they get them involved. So it's almost like music therapy, but Sometimes it gets a little bit chaotic and loud. (laughs) So a lot of the children arrive prepared and their amazing teachers have told them that it's going to be loud. So you may want to bring your headphones or, um, or whatever, whatever. So it's, um, I think it's well received in that sense. That's really cool. Okay, Pam, tell us about your background. How did you start working with this population? Well, I guess I've been a singer, a jazz singer, since I was 15 and I wanted to do music all my life and wanted to sing all my life and went to uni and completed my Bachelor of Music and singing in as a lead singer in various bands across Sydney and New South Wales and I kind of came to a halt and thought what am I going to do I can't be a singer for the rest of my life I'm not up there with the you know the greats <laughs> as much as I enjoy it I yeah was unsure of the future anyway I was working at the time as a social educator and for a disability organization and one of the afternoons I happened to make some music they had this gorgeous old piano there and I made some music for the residents or the the clients there and they had a basket of old instruments and I handed them all out and I thought wow this is this could be really cool I wonder if I can combine my music degree and what I'd learned my experience I guess of singing and playing and stuff together with working with 
people with a disability. So that night I went home and Googled it madly and found that there was actually a thing called music therapy. I was like, wow. And there was a (laughs) course just down the road from my house. So I was like, oh, this is amazing. This is meant to be. So yeah, I completed the postgraduate degree of music therapy in 2004, I believe. I then went after that, went went my first year of you know, being a, a new grad out of university, I I went out and I had like five different hats on five different days of the week, working with different populations. And I really kind of was burnt out towards the end of it, actually. But in that, I really found that, um, you know, on, on my Mondays, I was working at a, a school that was called Giant Steps, which is a autism specific school. And I learned so much. It was a, a transdisciplinary team of occupational therapists, speech therapists, social workers, um, the lot. It was amazing. And and I learned about visuals and about prompting and it, it was just amazing. So I think through that I just wanted to learn more and find out more and, yeah, impact people in a positive way, I guess, with autism. So, mm-hmm. Was there something that drew you to the autistic population specifically? Well, I guess um, I, in my placement at university, I'd done some work with Robin Howitt, who was my clinical educator at the time, and he was amazing. And we worked with a group of boys, and I never forget the moment when a boy was rocking in his chair and he had kind of I guess no purpose of rocking. It was just something that he was doing within a a, you know a sensory, or maybe it was anxiety, whatever. But Robin made this amazing melody that matched his rhythm that he was rocking in. And I'll never forget that he just stopped. The boy stopped, and he looked at Robin in the eye, and everything. It was like it was like the world had stopped because there was this beautiful connection that, hey, he realised that Robin was in his world and was creating music for him and that this was a really special time. So I learned a lot from him and since then I've been able to kind of, I guess, replicate that, those experiences in more or less a similar way, yeah. And, And I think that's what really draws me to having those moments of connectedness where we meet each other in the music, whether it be through rhythm or whether it be through melody on the piano, on the guitar, whatever it is that just seems to really motivate and catch the attention, I guess, of children with autism. So, yeah. That's beautiful. So how would you explain what music therapy is to someone on the street? What is your elevator pitch? Oh dear, I think I'm still working on my elevator pitch, to be honest. <laughs> it's one of those things that music therapy is um, is so difficult to explain to the layperson who doesn't know anything about it without kind of a, a visual. But look, I'll give it a go. So <laughs> look, I think that music therapy is the planned and creative use of music, obviously improvisation or, you know, a piece of music that has already been written and used for non-musical goals. So it may be for the well-being of a person in palliative care. It might be for communication goals for a child with speech problems, or it might be social communication for a child with autism. So, yeah, we work on non-musical goals, non-educational goals, and we're not entertainers, I guess. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Yeah, well said. For listeners who don't know, I did a music therapy program in San Francisco, California about five years ago now. It was kind of an extended program because I just took my time. (laughs) But I finished my coursework and now just need to complete my internship hours. Can you talk a little bit about the requirements to become a certified music therapist? Yeah, so ours is a little bit different over here in in Australia. We don't sit an examination, a board certified, is that what you said it was? Board certified exam? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So ours is all coursework. So it's 
two years postgraduate where you have pretty intensive placements. So when I did it, it was two years and it was classified as part-time, but there was no way in the world that I could work with anything else or do anything else during that time. It was definitely full-time course, but I guess in terms of their way of putting it, it was <laughs> it was part-time. So yeah, we, we have 640 hours of clinical placement to achieve before we become a registered music therapist. And to become a registered music therapist, we need to not only do those 640 hours, but register then with the association, um, the Australian Music Therapy Association. So yeah, they're bound by a you know code of ethics, and each year we have our continuing professional development points that we have to gain and continue in order to keep our currency of our registration. Mm-hmm. Yeah, the difference with the US is that there is the coursework which you can do in undergraduate in some programs. Mine was an equivalency program, so since I already had a bachelor's degree in psychology. I did an accelerated program for two years that gave me the equivalence of another bachelor's degree, but this time in music therapy. Right. And then from there, people can go do their postgrad and master's in music therapy. But we have to do 1,200 hours of field work. Wow. So 300 in school while you're taking classes, and then afterwards 900 with a supervisor in a specified setting and then the board exam, and then also the continuing education credits, like you're saying. But in the U.S., they usually require people to have a music degree before. Yeah, same. So mine was one of the few that was accepting applicants who had degrees in something else, like some other kind of social science. So that's why I went with that school. Right. Ours here is a little different. You can come from an education perspective or I I knew a nurse who became a music therapist as well. So as long as you meet the needs, the criteria of the, you know, grade eight of piano skills, as long as your skills were up there, I guess, and you also had a degree in something that was kind of relevant. (laughs) Yeah. So what's your main instrument? Oh, for me, it's always been my voice, but I learned piano at the age of, you know, probably from six or seven and have taught myself guitar since, I don't know, since music therapy, um, my schooling days. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. So I, I studied piano since I was four and, well, you know, took proper lessons till maybe I was 18, but I'm not a natural singer and I picked up guitar very much later in my life, just to do the music therapy program. So it was hard for me to catch up musically, honestly. Mm. Like just playing piano wasn't enough. You have to be able to accompany yourself singing. A hundred percent. And look, Rachel, I I had to audition to get into the course that I went to. And the first round, I didn't get in because Robin Howitt, the, the man that was the clinical educator, he said to me, I think you need to go away and learn how to improvise, mm. get better at your your musicianship, your your skills at the, on the piano instead of just reading music, you know, be able to feel it, be able to take off with it. So I spent that year just oh, going hard at it. I just wasn't going to give up. So I knew it was something that I was really passionate about. So, yeah, I did that. But it's um, I think it's very important to have those skills that, not only the improvisation kind of skills, but just the ability to stop, listen, to create something on the go that suits the needs of the child or the individual that you're working with at any time, you know. Right. What are some common misconceptions about music therapy? Oh, look, I've, I've had a few. <laughs> so you're a sound therapist or, you know, you work with, Tomatus, the head, headset recordings that, you know, kind of manipulate different frequencies, if you like, that you're listening to to improve special awareness or whatever it may be. Also, I've had a lot of people, I guess, think that music therapy is just playing music and that I guess then that they might think that 
I don't know if I can listen to some music on my iPod or <laughs> my phone or whatever. It's it's totally fine. It's it's my music therapy, and I don't need a music therapist. Yeah, I've heard that too about just being the person who presses play <laughs> on the music player, or even someone said, "Oh, music therapy." Well, I have. I'm a singer, and I have something wrong with my throat. Can you help me with that? Like something physical. Mm. I'm like. That's not really what we do. No. Can you talk a little bit about the importance of the therapeutic relationship between a music therapist and their client? Yeah, I guess building a rapport is, number one, it's paramount to everything from the get-go. So building that rapport and getting to know each other and getting to know their likes, dislikes, strengths, weaknesses, knowing exactly what goals we're working on. That therapeutic relationship can really bring about some change if it is, if the foundations are right, if the foundations have been strong from the get go. I find that that therapeutic relationship within music is is not only about playing, but listening as well. Listening, whether they're talking, whether they're humming, whether they're playing any kind of instrument. It's really about silence. Mm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So you mentioned earlier that a lot of different people can benefit from music therapy services. So could you give a few more examples of the different populations? Yeah, sure. So look, it can work, work across the lifespan whether it be from neonatal units within hospitals and their parents to working with children or adults with disabilities, to working with geriatrics in nursing homes. Um, it really is a, a, a across the lifespan because music, it's a universal language as we know. You know, everybody loves music generally <laughs> speaking mm-hmm. and everybody kind of really innately responds to music, um, whether it be a, tapping your foot or singing or humming or whatever it may be. I think we all have the innate musicality within us to participate in music. Yeah. And I will also add one of the populations I did one of my field works with is one that people might not really think about. And it is the acute psychiatric population. So I was working at a clinic, an inpatient clinic that I think maybe had 25 beds and there was a on-site music therapist there who was my supervisor and she would organize these drum circles and it was really cool to see how people connected it was like a support group but through music some people who may not feel comfortable expressing what's going on with them through words might feel more comfortable doing it through music and there was also a component of lyric analysis where the music therapist would play a song and people would go around the circle and talk about what stood out to them. Mm -hmm. And it's a different way of expressing yourself also because it's kind of showing the music therapist maybe what you're focusing on. And from that, you can kind of talk about it and go a little bit deeper to help them heal with whatever they're going through. Yeah, absolutely. I think songwriting is is a beautiful way of doing that as well. I did a support group when I was living in Singapore in uh, 2006 to 2010. I facilitated a support group actually for cancer survivors and we did a lot of lyric analysis and drumming circles as well. But songwriting seemed to really help them overcome the the fears I guess of it coming back or of where they were at that stage. Yeah one of my supervisors also worked at a state hospital so using music to help determine if the person was clinically insane or not. Oh wow. And if that person was able to stand trial. So it just kind of shows the wide variety that music therapy can be used with. Yeah, absolutely. Amazing. My employee, actually, she's just about to start working at a rehabilitation hospital and she's going to start a a stroke 
victims choir and she's also working closely um, with a speech therapist as well. So it's very much on the neurological kind of medical setting, I guess, in that sense. Right. Can you share some examples of goals you might work on with your clients? Sure. So look, there's cognitive goals, for example. It might be um, sequencing memory or one or two or three step instructions. So these these goals are, for example, sequencing. It might be, I might be singing Somewhere Over the Rainbow, for example. Can I give you an example? Yeah, please. All right. So if I'm singing Somewhere Over the Rainbow, it might be to help them slow down, but at the same time, reach them their goal of sequencing, being able to follow a sequence of instructions. So I would use some chimes, which I have here. Somewhere over the rainbow way, up high, So with that, I'm not sure if you could hear my, I was tapping my knee at the same time, like in the break. Mm -hmm. So what I would do with a child working on something like that is I'd get them, I'd get these chimes out on the ground in an order and I'd get them to tap the floor in between so they could feel the rhythm of the song of how slow it's meant to be. Mm. And so they knew exactly when to hit the next chime. So that whole idea of sequencing coming down the scale, being slow, being rhythmic, and getting them to follow the instructions given. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. And how is this generalized to their everyday life? In schooling, obviously, you've got to read books. You've got to be able to follow one or two step instructions you've got to be able to follow any instruction at all really Mm -hmm. (laughs) so in order to do that if they're struggling with memory or struggling with those instructions given this is a really nice and motivating way to kind of be able to reach those goals and then obviously transfer those skills across so in terms of transferring those skills It's really important to tell the parents or have the parents within the room and then also for them to tell their teachers, tell whoever it is that's working with them to continue singing, continue doing this, oh, such and such has been doing this in music therapy and it's proving to help with his sequencing or whatever it may be. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I think the communication, the lines of communication between um allied health workers, whether it be the speech, occupational therapist, and the educators, obviously, and the parents is really, really important. I've just given you given you one example of goals, but I can kind of go on. (laughs) Yeah. Could you give us another one? Yeah, sure. So look, obviously there's social goals like turn taking and waiting and eye contact, body language, levels of energy and learning how to read a room in terms of what's appropriate behavior and what's not, yeah, appropriately respond, I guess. Communication goals such as both working on receptive and expressive language and also working on targeted sounds which may be b, p, d, la, you know, g, for example. But obviously working with a speech therapist is is so good because then you can kind of really focus on the sounds that need to happen in order, I guess, in developmental order. Mm -hmm. Also, there's, you know, physical goals such as gross and fine motor skills and coordination of left and right and finding their internal rhythm. Mm -hmm. I usually start every session with playing the drums after a greeting song, for example, we would go into using some drums to ground the child to get them really ready to feel their own rhythm. So I might set up two drums and it might be a big drum and a small drum. So I would play something like... um, There's 
listen, listen to the drums. Listen, listen to the drums. Listen to the small drum. Listen to the big drum. Listen, listen to the drums. Listen, listen to the drums. Something like that. But you know, might we might go quiet. Play very quietly and play fast, loud. Getting them used to being loud, being soft, and bringing that awareness to the dynamics. Yeah, and the motor skills too. That gross motor. Movement. Yeah, absolutely. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and having left and right, I might, I might say, you know, just play with one hand. You know, your left hand. Just play with your right hand. Now play with both and go fast. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah, the cool thing about music therapy is they're working on all these skills while having fun, so they're more likely to stay in the room with you. I mean, if you've already established that therapeutic relationship. Like it's a fun thing that they're looking forward to. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, I've got some some kiddos that really like some cool pop music and, you know, arranging different types of music is, you know, to work for them. They might introduce me to some music that I've never heard of before, but I work on it and go, okay, let's do this within this, you know, let's play the tambourine in this part, but... Let's do some some bells in this part, you know, mm-hmm. depending on their, you know, level of functioning and, and where they're at. But, yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's great fun. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I, I think I often have too much fun in my job. <laughs> <laughs> Could you talk about how you use improvisation in music therapy? Yeah. Um, Oh, look, just last week I was working with the young young man. He's about 17. He was telling me that he, he just absolutely hates going grocery shopping. He hates it. <laughs> I hate it when I get to the aisles and there's people everywhere and I can't get what I need to help my mum go shopping. And so we ended up writing this grocery shopping blues. <laughs> <laughs> but it was, yeah, I got the grocery shopping blues. Something like that, you know. <laughs> I got the grocery shopping blues. I'm feeling it today. Uh, hey, hey. <laughs> well, I don't want to go shopping. I just want to get out of here. <laughs> Something like that. Oh, I love it. I think just working in the moment of, okay, so what are we going to do about that, you know? Mm-hmm. And we identified different, different, you know, parts of the shopping. Um, it was a really visual experience, I guess, you know, going through different parts of the grocery shop, you know, and what we usually need to buy and what, you know, where the issues come up. Is it the noise? Is it the too many people? They're all chitter-chatter, chitter-chatter, chitter-chatting all the time, you know, so... I really felt for him because I'm exactly the same. <laughs> hey, grocery <laughs> shopping. <laughs> the blues is such a great song to write to. I remember when I was doing a field work at a children's hospital in Oakland, my supervisor would write songs with the patients, these little kids who had been in the hospital for maybe weeks, and it was called the hospital blues. Yeah. So it's a great way to just let it out and feel validated. Yeah. Absolutely. Talk about it and and really experience the emotion of it, but in a very supported way, I guess. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Supported and fun kind of way that it allows you the freedom to explore it. Right. Do you do any family-based services where you'll get the parents to come into the room also? Um, My clinic days, the majority of my clients' parents come in and I kind of request it really. I would prefer it if they came in because it's not only about the child but it's about the family and about how they can help as well at home. And as I touched on before about transferring those skills within the home or across all environments, you know, 
and often we'll discover these things together. Often will be something will come up. It might have been in a meltdown, for example. In the music room, it might be, you know, the child might be melting down and, you know, crying, coming in really highly aroused and can't seem to come down and bring down. And and it might be just in the in the safe space of mum and myself squeezing the child, giving them deep pressure and squeezing the child to a, a really simple kind of tempo, I, I guess, at your heartbeat. Mm-hmm. You want to be that really slow and grounded heartbeat measured response for them to slow their breathing down, slow their heartbeat down and listen and get squeezed as well at the same time. So using music, I guess, to, like, you know, made up little songs that I often do mm-hmm. <laughs> about, you know, squeezing. Um, and it's often in those moments that I guess mums and dads and whoever the caregiver is realise that how important it is and how accessible it is to themselves being able to sing something as simple as like a little ditty, you know, whatever it may be, just to really use their own voice in these times of, you know, uncertainty and, and really like those struggling times, you know. Yeah. So Pam, you've also started your coursework to become a registered behavior technician. Tell us about how you fuse applied behavior analysis and music therapy. Well, look, I'm still learning. (laughs) I really wanted to, um, when I went to the Global Autism Summit last year, which I'm sure you want to talk about later, Mm -hmm. I really was very, very much taken by behavior analysis and I wonder how I can find this sweet spot of between, you know, music therapy and, and behavior an- analysis because it's they're almost two polar kind of different things really. One's very expressive and creative and whatever. And behavior analysis is is it's a really measured approach to achieving functional learning or capacity, you know. And I guess finding that sweet spot, I guess, with where I work, I work at a school that's called Woodbury Research and Education, working with BCBAs and RBTs. You know, it's a, it's a really great place because within the school they identify the goals very, very clearly and as a group, as a, as a team kind of thing, team approach. I'm really enjoying, I guess, seeing how these kiddos can kind of get their functional life skills improved, I guess, through ABA, but also seeing how music therapy can approach their flexibility and work on their flexibility and a non-rigid rigid kind of way of being in any type of setting. It's about really letting go and experiencing a moment of connectedness Mm -hmm. but at the same time I can see learning goals as well as you know all of these goals that might be presented to me from the whole entire team and then how I implement those creatively seems to work for these kids because it's so motivating music is so motivating it's fun it's exciting it's it gets them laughing and and humming and some even talk which is a really big achievement I think for them Mm -hmm. yeah I love that sweet spot that you're talking about between ABA and music therapy can you talk about how you collaborate with speech therapists on communication goals yeah sure so during every school holidays or vacation the speech therapist that I work with and myself we facilitate holiday intensive programs that focus on both speech therapy goals as well as developing social goals or social skills. There are usually three to four groups that attend for a week for about an hour each day and these groups are placed together based on their age and as well as their matching kind of abilities if you like. So during this time, we may be working with a group of children who may may have assistive technology devices 
or they might we might be just working on a group that are targeting specific sounds. So we'll do a whole heap of activities that'll be musical as well as we'll play games that I will improvise around musically that'll be targeting sounds as well as turn taking at the same time. That's the beauty, I guess, of music therapy is that you can do so many different things all at the same time. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, you can work on left and right, you can work or coordination, you can work on sound production of, you know, the shh sound or whatever it may be while still drumming or <laughs> something else. <laughs> it's fun. Right. And as a music therapist, you have to be paying attention to all those things and observing other responses they might be making that might give you insight into another area that you could work on in the future. It's a lot of work. It really is. A lot of processing time goes on within the session and after the session. So I think it's really important to always debrief with whoever you're working with. If it is the speech therapist, so we often work together, not only in the holidays, but with clients together on a weekly basis. So we always meet prior to the session and then after the session to completely debrief and work on the plan going into the next next week. So, yeah, definitely a lot to take in during the session as well. Yeah. What have you noticed about music therapy and sensory needs? So last year I found myself working with many children with sensory processing disorders on top of an autism diagnosis So I found that when these clients came to me, often they would present as being either sensory seeking towards specific instruments or completely sensory defensive. So I needed to find a way to transfer these skills, the skills that they had learnt to overcome these sensory needs in other environments such as the home or within their school. So in mid-2019, I consulted the speech therapist that I work with as well as an occupational therapist to understand more about how and therefore what instruments would be most ideal to target specific areas of the sensory processing experience. So the music therapy, I then created a music therapy instrument kit that really highlights a whole different areas of sensory needs. So for example, I've just got I've got one here. So this is called a cabasa. So it's a um, South American instrument and has metal beads around a, a round shaft. And um, for example, working with a child who came in quite sensory defensive towards this instrument, what we would do is demonstrate it on myself first or on the parent and then slowly use it on on the child and then week by week get the child to have more exposure. I guess it's a bit like exposure therapy really. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so, yeah, getting them more exposed to using that instrument. So the, the child that I was working with, with this instrument that really highlighted this specific instrument anyway, ended up by the end of the music therapy term that we were working in, he would go up to the kibasa initiating play himself with that, whereas initially he'd started absolutely freaking out by... Mm. Mm-hmm. Any any kind of touch to it, yeah. So it's quite it's quite a cold instrument. The metal is quite cold. It's um, I don't know. I I guess it's an individual kind of feeling. Really, it's a sensory experience. So we can't really explain it for everybody, right? Just like some pieces of fabric might be really uncomfortable for someone, yeah, and that's just their own individual senses. Yeah, that's right. So, yeah, I created a music therapy instrument kit, which is available from my website, um, a shameless plug here, musical, musicalmonkeys.com.au, or mm-hmm. <laughs> going into COVID, the land of COVID, which we're all going through, which is awful. I've kind of had to pivot, I guess, in, in terms of how I've seen my clients and how the delivery 
it is done. And that's via Zoom telehealth sessions. So I was able to, I lost three of my jobs, which were, which were in schools. And then the other two days were at the clinic. So I was able, thankfully, to transfer the clients that I see at the clinic to telehealth. So in that time and space that I had, I guess I was able to really think about what was missing and I felt that people in rural and remote areas in Australia, across Australia, it really I discovered how that they are on these waiting lists for months and months, even years, to get to see a speech therapist or an occupational therapist. And I thought that, well, this is an opportunity to really meet the, their needs and, and try and capture that area, I guess. I guess it could work um, not only just in r- rural and remote areas but anywhere in, in the world really. Mm-hmm. So I created the musicalness.com and basically it's about promoting the use of the kit that I created, the music therapy kit, as well as, you know, consultative online accessible music therapy cool what would a telehealth music therapy session look like the clients that I was able to transfer to a weekly session they all purchased the kit through their NDIS funding so that was great that they were able to have something at home with them so that if I said all right grab the castanets now, we're going to work on, you know, isolating the left hand and then isolating the right hand. And I might play a melody that is rhythmic for them to join in within. There's, uh, look, there's, depending on on what, what I'm working on in terms of the goals, it really depends on how it looks. Like, for example, oh, this is this week, Monday, I am... Um, I worked with a boy who's nine and higher end of the spectrum, I guess, and really struggling socially with his friends and school and having meltdowns because of the social differences, I guess, that he's having. And we created a song. We wrote a song together about friends and what we do, Mm -hmm. (laughs) you know, how good they are and how when you have them around, they're really great and everything. When everything's working, it's really good. But when it's not working, what do we do? And trying to work through problem solving and how what he feels would be a good solution in these times. Yeah, I think increasing coping skills during this time is so important for everyone. Yeah, absolutely. Our kiddos here have only just gone back to school for a good maybe – five weeks now and yeah it's a really tough time for everyone but for kids to try to understand this and I think the behaviors seem to come out more because maybe they don't not understanding how why everything's so different and Mm -hmm. yeah yeah so Pam could you hold up the music therapy kit to the camera so people who watch the video can see it and maybe just Talk about the different instruments that are in there. Oh, yeah, sure. First of all, we have this 12-inch drum. It has a synthetic skin and it's very durable. It's great for grounding clients and grounding kids to listening to some music, whether it be playing music or receptive, like listening to anything on a CD or your phone. Mm-hmm. Um, this is what it sounds like. <laughs> um, yeah, then next we have the castanets. Really great for left and right isolating your hands. Um, also for coordination and strengthening fine motor skills. Mm-hmm. Then we have the kibasa. And look, I think I kind of spoke enough about that before, but, yeah, um, yeah really great for sensory needs. We have the guiro. The guiro is also a woodblock, so it has two tones to it yeah, or two, mm, two sounds to it. One, the tick-tock, which is 
or the other, which is the scraping sound, which is the guiro sound. Um, yeah, they're, they're good for, um, I guess, really pinpointing rhythm mm -hmm. as a wood block. It's like really defining the rhythm, but also really getting a different kind of colour or a timbre to a sound within making music together. Then we have these shakers. Mm -hmm. They're different weights, so they have different weighted beads within them. The blue one is heavier and the yellow one is lighter and softer kind of shake. I'll just give you a demo. Here's the blue one and here's the yellow one. Mm, yeah, you can hear that. So, yeah, it's nice. It's a nice way to get them involved in creating the music and how they want it to sound. And then also there is this lovely frame stick or yeah. frame maker. You mm -hmm. may know it as. But what I like about this is that it's um, clear so you can see these beads. It's a really nice way to calm down a session if they've been doing some big gross motor activities and then coming to an end of the session where we can look at this and sing about um, calming down and then we'll, I'll get them to turn it over and it's calming down. We have a kazoo, which is really great for oral motor skills. Um, <laughs> Who doesn't love a kazoo, really? <laughs> Maybe par parents that have, you know, bought this this kit. I'm not sure. Um, <laughs> they're all really great sensory and goal-related instruments that, yeah, are available on my website. <laughs> <laughs> we'll put a link to that in our show notes so people can go check it out. Which one is your favorite instrument? Oh, by far, I think the, the kibasa. Oh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Changing topics, Pam. Last year you attended Global Summit in Bali, which was our first annual international conference. Of course, unfortunately, we aren't having it this year, but hopefully next year or sometime soon. That's actually where we met. We were staying at the same villa. Yeah, you are my villa mom. <laughs> <laughs> so what was that experience like for you attending Global Summit? Ah, oh, look, it was fantastic. It was amazing. So the Global Summit was my first experience of being involved with the Global Autism Project. I'd heard about it and wanted to go and volunteer, but it just wasn't within my reach, I guess, at that time in my life. But this came up, this Global Summit, where it was only in Bali for me, obviously very close. And so, yeah, having three kids and taking off to Bali by myself for a week of professional development was, you know, an absolute dream come true. I I um, couldn't get out of Australia quick enough. So the whole experience really, really was fantastic. It taught me so much, a great deal, obviously, about behaviour analysis and obviously made me seek more education in that, that I learned so much about a lot of things really, but clinical supervision being one of them, dissemination, the work that's been carried out all across the world that Global Autism Project do. But most importantly, I, I think I can speak for many people who attended the Global Summit, was that I learned so much about who I am as a clinician and as and as a leader, as a as a human on this earth, about what my strengths are, my weaknesses are, and and how I can I guess where I see the strengths in myself, how I can lean on others and use other people's strengths to get the best outcome for the clients that we serve. So, yeah. Yeah. Wonderful. I hope we can see each other again soon at the next summit. Oh, me too. Me too. <laughs> I really, really look forward to a, yeah. a drink on a balcony somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> So Pam, I'd like to close with one last question. What advice would you give to caregivers who are looking to incorporate music into their child's lives, but maybe don't have access to a music therapist in their area? Well, look, I think that ultimately everybody has music within them. And I think culturally, everyone's music is really different. So I think that even highlights 
their own strengths even more because they know their own culture so, so well. But everyone's born with a heartbeat. Everyone's born with a voice. Everyone's got the ability to use this, these skills, these, you know, beautiful skills to reach and connect with their own child or with others. I think, you know, if there aren't music therapists around there, I think you really have to be able to use your own skills. Yeah, or they can look you up on, what was that website? Themusicalnest.com, yeah. Yeah, because you are offering remote services, so it's great to give people access who might not otherwise have the opportunity to. Yeah. Thank you, Rachel. All right. Okay, Pam. Well, this has been so much fun and you're really motivating me to pursue this side of my career. So thank you for that. Do it, do it. (laughs) (laughs) Okay. So at the end of every session, we usually do a goodbye song. So we're always sitting in a circle if it's a group or just individually at the piano or wherever. I just want to say it's not my song. It's not my own song. Someone else wrote it. That's all right. (laughs) But it goes something like this. Oh, 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 it's time to say goodbye. Oh, 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 it's time to say goodbye. Goodbye to Rachel. something like that. Thanks for tuning in to Autism Knows No Borders. Pam shared some wonderful examples of how music therapy can benefit individuals with autism. I'd like to add my own personal account from when I used music in ABA to increase a client's verbal communication. At the time, my client was a middle school student who attended weekly group music therapy sessions for up to 30 minutes at a time. For this story, I'll call him Alan. He was able to elicit one or two word phrases, play instruments when cued, and engage in call and response imitation on the djembe. Building on his strength of having some language, our goal was for Alan to sing along to his favorite music more often. I would play for the group, and in the beginning, he was only singing along two times per session. Given that he had an auditory delay, Providing Alan with a clear visual sign of when to sing increased his participation in the activity. For example, if I wanted to cue him in so that he would fill in the blank in a song, I would pause and point my guitar in his direction. By the end of the month, he was singing along up to seven times per session. Over time, we gradually stopped prompting him and adjusted his goals to target longer phrases. Most importantly, Alan was having fun. The communication skills a child learns in music therapy can be generalized to their daily lives. At the end of the day, our goal was for Alan to be able to express his needs, opening up opportunities for a better quality of life. As Pam mentioned, we all have music within us. We are born with a heartbeat, rhythmic breathing, and a voice. Music can help parents connect with their children and build on skills that may lead to more independence. Thanks for listening. Take care. You've been watching Autism Knows No Borders. If you like this video, please give it a thumbs up and subscribe to our channel. Also, we'd love to hear from you, so let us know what you think in the comment section. Click here to watch another interview from our podcast. You can also find us on your favorite podcast app. Tune in each week for engaging conversations of how people across the globe are inspiring change and building community. Thanks for watching. Take care.